This is Sweden, a country known for its high level of state welfare, which has made its approach to the coronavirus pandemic a bit of a surprise. As the rest of the Nordics, Europe and basically the entire world were shutting down due to the coronavirus, Sweden took a far more relaxed approach, never bringing in the full force of lockdown measures that so many others felt compelled to do, preferring a lighter touch approach instead. In doing so, Sweden avoided the stringent restrictions brought in by many of its peers. A study by Hale et al, measuring stringency, found Sweden had the lightest restrictions compared to the United States, France, Italy, Spain or Germany. This light touch approach though, has come at a cost. Sweden's per capita infection rate is the highest in the Nordics and the second highest in Europe, just behind Luxembourg, if you exclude microstates such as San Marino, the Vatican City and Andorra. The intention was to minimise the impact on Sweden's economy. Swedish policymakers noted early on that the trouble with a policy of lockdown is that it is not sustainable, therefore trying to avoid this through a light touch lockdown. The early results for Sweden, if you look at Q1 GDP growth, have been relatively good. GDP growth in the first quarter was 0.1%. This was far better than the 3.8% contraction in the Eurozone on average. So does this imply that Sweden's relatively strong economic performance was due to its relaxed lockdown measures? Well, no, or at least not exactly. Whilst it is true that Sweden hasn't suffered as bad a drop in public activity as others have, it has still seen a dramatic drop. Regardless of Sweden's public policy to stay largely open, the drop in outside activity suggests that a significant proportion of Swedes have decided to self-regulate. This implies that public policy can be a limited tool if the public believes there is still a threat. So if it wasn't public policy, why has Sweden performed better to date? The impact of the restrictions depend not only on the level of the restrictions, but on how vulnerable the economy is to the restrictions. With economists attributing Sweden's relatively strong performance to the structure of its economy. Travel and tourism make up a small proportion of the Swedish economy compared to countries such as France or Spain, for example. These sectors have taken an absolute hammering since COVID-19 led to mandatory quarantines and heavily restricted flight numbers. With a smaller domestic tourism sector, Sweden has been able to offset some of the impact through increased domestic spending from its citizens, who have been forced to abandon their holidays abroad, perhaps to a greater extent than other countries, a small win for the Swedish economy. Secondly, the proportion of the workforce vulnerable to the virus is considered to be low. A recent risk employment index calculated by Dora and Gambacorta, measuring the percentage of jobs threatened by the pandemic, showed Sweden ranks in the lowest risk category. Moreover, Sweden has relatively fewer people employed by micro-businesses, which are businesses employing less than 10 people. This is important, as the ECB has attributed the high number of small businesses as a key factor in why the euro area's GDP will shrink a staggering 8% this year. As we've discussed in a previous video on the economic impact of furloughing, which is worth a watch after this video by clicking on the YouTube card appearing on your screen now, small businesses are more vulnerable to economic shocks. Amongst other things, this is because of their lower cash flow buffers, meaning they are more prone to go bust. Thirdly, the ability of Swedes to work at home. A large segment of the Swedish economy can function despite social distancing. A study by Ningel and Newman estimated the number of jobs in the economy that can be done from home for a number of different countries, based on their sectorial composition. It found that 44% of Swedish jobs can be done from home, one of the highest proportions in the world, surpassed only by Luxembourg and Switzerland. In comparison, the United States has a share of 42%, while the corresponding shares for large euro area countries vary between 32 and 38 percent. However, saying all of this, economists and institutions are predicting Sweden to follow the same economic path as most of Europe. According to the SEB, a leading Nordic financial services group, Swedish GDP is predicted to decline by 14 percent in Q2, and despite a recovery in the second half of the year, GDP is expected to decline by nearly 7% in 2020 overall, with the jobless rate peaking at 14% in autumn 2020. So in Sweden's case, what are the main reasons behind its drop in GDP to come? A main weakness of the Swedish economy 
is what in normal times we consider a strength, its openness to trade and interconnectivity with the rest of the world. Sweden is a very open economy, with a high level of international trade. Trade accounts for 50% of Swedish GDP, with 70% of Swedish exports going to the EU. With such a high dependency on trade, it is therefore no surprise that as demand in its main export markets collapses, it would have a big impact on Swedish companies. The SEB predicts that Swedish exports will have declined by 15% in the first half of 2020 alone on par to the decline it experienced during the financial crisis, although the latter occurred over an entire year. Such an external demand-side shock has little to do with Sweden's light-touch lockdown. Another potential threat is its high level of household debt. Yes, debt. Something which doesn't normally spring to mind when discussing Nordic economies. According to a 2017 study, household indebtedness as a percentage of GDP is higher in Sweden than in Germany, France, the US, Italy, or Spain. The problem with such a high level of household indebtedness is that such households have a poorer capacity to manage unexpected losses of income or increases in expenditure. Reductions in household ability to repay debt, caused by a pandemic for example, can impact default rates, solvency, or economic liquidity. However, Sweden's Financial Supervisory Authority has tried to mitigate this through suspending compulsory mortgage repayments until June 2021, a common policy across the world. Looking at the macro level, debt at the sovereign level is low in Sweden. It was around 38% of GDP in 2018, according to the IMF. Low government debt is a common trend in the Nordics, which in theory provides them with a unique advantage against other advanced economies, such as the UK, France, USA or Italy, who have debt to GDP ratios close to or exceeding 100%. Sweden and the Nordics have the fiscal headspace to continue to introduce stimulus measures without necessitating the high levels of austerity or cutbacks in future years, which will no doubt hamper the longer term recovery of some highly indebted nations. For context, Swedish public debt is set to hit 50% of GDP by the end of 2021, a very manageable level compared to the 136% in the US or the 114% euro area average, according to the SEB. This is of course only a theory, as recent fiscal policy in many countries has seen record government stimulus packages, the full effects of which are still unknown. Now, it is important to point out that the ongoing economic crisis has so far been primarily a crisis of the real economy. One concern though, is that this could develop into a much wider financial crisis. Whilst the Swedish banking system is large and interconnected, compared to the rest of the banks in Europe, Swedish banks are at present in a good position to handle the crisis. The percentage of non-performing loans in the Swedish banking sector is around half a percent, which is one of the lowest in the EU, where the average is around 3%. A stronger banking balance sheet gives Sweden the manoeuvrability to combat the crisis and is an indicator of a healthy underlying business environment at least pre-COVID-19. Overall, the SEB estimates that Sweden will be one of the best performers in Europe, with a decline in GDP of 6.5% compared to the Euro area average estimated at 9.6%, the Nordics at 8%, or the OECD's 7%. We have seen that while Sweden's light-touch lockdown has prevented the same level of decline in activity as seen in other countries, Swedes have also decided to self-regulate, diluting the impact of light-touch lockdown restrictions. The structure of Sweden's economy has helped prevent the large first quarter drops other nations have seen, but as an export-driven nation, it's expected to experience a large fall in annual GDP, just like its peers. However, its low level of government debt, like other Nordic nations, means it will have the fiscal headspace to mitigate the impact on the economy without years of the swinging austerity cuts which may hamper the longer term recovery of other countries. As we come to the end of this video, we at Alt Simplified would love to hear what your thoughts are on Sweden's light touch lockdown. Do you agree with the approach? Do you think there was a better way? Or was the scale of the economic impact inevitable regardless of what policy actions Sweden took? Let us know in the comments below and if you like this video, please do give us a like and consider subscribing.
See you in the next video.